Hello and welcome once again to Cinematic Excrement. I do apologize for the recent hiatus. I had some health issues to get over, including a recent bout with COVID. Yes, it finally got me, but I'm okay now. And I moved recently, which was a very time-consuming process. And with a new location comes a new backdrop. I hope you like it. If you don't, well, you come over here and fucking redecorate. I'm not doing it. Anyway, let us at long last return to the Worst Picture Project. This morning, or evening, or whenever you're watching this, I don't know your schedule, we find ourselves in the year 2013 with a movie simply known as Movie 43. This is a sketch comedy film and the brainchild of longtime Farrelly Brothers collaborator Charles B. Wessler, who wanted to make something in a similar vein to Kentucky Fried Movie but for modern audiences, with each sketch featuring a different cast and crew. In addition to the Farrelly Brothers, he initially recruited Trey Parker, Matt Stone, and David and Jerry Zucker. All but Peter Farrelly ultimately backed out. And if you're trying to make the next Kentucky Fried Movie and the guys who made the original piss off, that is probably a sign that you're on the wrong track. Wessler soldiered on, determined to get his movie made, but ran into another problem. Money. He pitched the movie to several studios who all told him to get stuffed, another sign you might be on the wrong track, before the movie finally found a home at Relativity Media and a whopping $6 million budget. Relativity Media has since gone on to declare bankruptcy. Twice. Which should give you some idea of how good they are at making wise business decisions. Kate Winslet and Hugh Jackman were the first actors cast for Movie 43, and their sketch was filmed right away and used to pitch the movie to other potential stars. And it worked. A few people did turn them down. George Clooney was pitched a sketch, and his response was, and I quote, no f***ing way. But several big names in Hollywood, many of whom were friends of Wessler, agreed to do the movie with the understanding that it would only be a few days of work and they could jump in whenever their schedules allowed. Waiting on those actors' schedules is largely why the movie took four years to complete. And they were clearly counting on the cast to convince people to plunk down their hard-earned cash to see this movie. They didn't have anything else to sell it. That ambiguous title certainly wasn't going to do the job. And look at the Blu-ray cover. It's just a lazily thrown together grid of 20 cast photos. Bare minimum amount of effort. And look at who they got for this thing. <gasps> Elizabeth Banks, Kristen Bell, Halle Berry, Kate Bosworth, Gerard Butler, Bobby Cannavale, Josh Duhamel, Anna Ferris, Richard Gere, Terrence Howard, Hugh Jackman, Johnny Knoxville, Justin Long, Christopher McLovin, Chloe Grace Moretz, Leah Schreiber, Sean William Scott, Emma Stone, Naomi Watts, and Kate Winslet. <sighs> Jesus Christ. <sighs> and those are just the people they could fit on the cover. I feel really bad for anyone who didn't make the cut. Imagine getting bumped from the Blu-ray cover in favor of Stifler. The movie was not screened for critics ahead of time, and when they finally did get a chance to watch it, they shredded it, resulting in a 4% on Rotten Tomatoes. Elizabeth Weitzman of the New York Daily News stated, I've seen nearly 4,000 movies over the last 15 years. Right now, I can't think of one worse than Movie 43. Several actors and directors who worked on the film refused to promote it, and it only made a little over $30 million at the box office. But thanks to its ridiculously low budget, that would make it a financial success, so good for them, I guess. Anyway, the overarching plot that loosely ties all the sketches together involves washed-up screenwriter Charlie Wessler, played by Dennis Quaid and named after the man responsible for this mess, desperately trying to pitch his new movie script to Hollywood executives, played by Greg Kinnear and Common. And then the sketches begin. Let's quickly go through them, shall we? First, we have The Catch, where Kate Winslet goes on a blind date with the city's most eligible bachelor, Hugh Jackman, and is shocked to discover he has balls growing out of his chin. That's the joke. The movie has only just begun, and they're already stealing ideas from South Park. No wonder Matt and Trey bailed. Then we have Homeschooled, where Liev Schreiber and Naomi Watts are homeschooling their son, but want him to have the full high school experience. That means they bully the shit out of him. Because nothing's funnier than child abuse. And they throw in some casual homophobia for good measure. And incest. Do you have protection? Ew. Next is The Proposition, where it looks like Chris Pratt and Anna Faris are about to propose to each other, but while Chris is proposing marriage, Anna has something else in mind. Will you poop on me? What? And if that had been the end of it, 
that might have actually been funny. But it just keeps going. There's an argument over whether he really loves her if he's not willing to poop on her. There's a discussion amongst his friends about the proper diet before going number two on your partner. It's a whole thing. There's even a scene where he scarfs a burrito and immediately washes it down with a laxative right before he's about to do the deed. Do the people who made this movie not understand how laxatives work? It's not going to instantly turn that burrito he just ate into poop. It'll make him poop out something, but it doesn't accelerate the human digestive system. If he really wanted to take full advantage of that burrito, he should have eaten it hours ago. Nearly three months since I last put out a cinematic excrement episode, and I make my grand return to explain how poop works. Was it worth the wait? And it ends with a diuretic explosion, because of course it does. By this point, it's already become pretty clear why Movie 43 failed. They're putting way too much effort into grossing the audience out and making them uncomfortable instead of actually being funny. Gross-out humor has its place, but you still need actual jokes. Otherwise, you're just being disgusting for the sake of it. And if being grossed out wasn't enough, this movie takes a really weird turn by including ads. Seriously, we're supposed to be watching Dennis Quaid pitch a movie script. Where the hell did the ads come from? There's one that plays like a PSA, reminding people to be kind to their machines like ATMs and copiers because there are children working inside them. I confess I did find this mildly amusing in a what kind of way. There's a really disturbing Tampax commercial that I can't believe the company signed off on. And there's an ad for the iBabe. It's like the iPod, except it's a life-size statue of a naked woman. For obvious reasons, I can't show you that one. So what do you think about putting commercials within the movie? Honestly, it's the least of the movie's problems. The iBabe thing also turns into a sketch where the company that makes it, led by Richard Gere, who looks like he'd rather be anywhere else right now, discusses a problem involving teenage boys getting a little too up close and personal with the unit's exhaust vent. I am sure we're all thinking of the same thing, so let's just get it out of the way. Can you f*** it? Excuse me? Can you f*** it? No. Ah. There's not much to say about the next few sketches as there are only so many ways I can say this isn't funny. There are two people in a grocery store having a sexually explicit argument over the PA. There's a middle school date where the girl suddenly has her first period and everyone freaks out. There's a couple of guys kidnapping a foul-mouthed leprechaun. There's Elizabeth Banks competing for her boyfriend's love with his pet animated cat. I have no explanation for why the cat is animated. And even if I did, I don't think it would help. There's an all-black basketball team that beats an all-white basketball team because they're black. That's it. That's the joke. We see Robin try his hand at speed dating while Batman keeps getting in the way. And did DC Comics seriously agree to this? How many connections does Charles Wessler have? The only remaining sketch that's particularly noteworthy, for all the wrong reasons, is Truth or Dare, which, like the movie's opening sketch, features a blind date. Ran out of ideas already, did we? The sketch stars Stephen Merchant and Halle Berry, who decide to skip the usual first date bullshit and play a round of Truth or Dare, which rapidly escalates to them doing cruel and disgusting things to other people in the restaurant and eventually each other. She blows out a blind kid's birthday candles, he gets a dick tattooed on his face, which I don't think I have to blur because it's not a real dick, but why take the risk? She gets enough plastic surgery to make Joan Rivers blush, and holy you only live twice, Batman! I... Why? Those are all of the sketches you'll find in the movie proper, but there are two more that the studio apparently decided went too far and did not make the theatrical cut. One involves Tony Shalhoub and Julianne Moore, who are supposedly searching for their daughter who ran away and recently resurfaced in a Girls Gone Wild video. And it's clear the father is less concerned about finding his daughter than he is about perving on young girls possibly including his daughter. Ew. Again. It's stupid and disgusting and not funny, but that's true of most of the sketches that made the final cut. Even the incestuous overtones don't seem like a deal breaker considering the homeschool sketch was approved, so I'm not really sure why this one got the axe, but it did end up on the Blu-ray as a bonus feature. 
The other sketch stars Anton Yelchin, RIP, as a necrophiliac who works at the morgue. Okay, this one I get. I understand why the studio would not want to unleash this one on the public because sweet Jesus, they wouldn't even sign off on putting this one on the Blu-ray. It is floating around on the internet if you're curious, but trust me, you're not missing much. Anyway, while all of these inane sketches are assaulting your senses, Dennis Quaid progressively becomes more and more desperate to sell his script. This desperation eventually pushes him over the edge, and he pulls out his gun! Now, do you want to hear the rest of my pitch? I, for one, choose death. And at one point, he tries to get one of the studio executives to suck off a security guard, and I assure you that does not make any more sense with context. And then the movie kinda goes meta and reveals the crew filming the scene, including director Peter Farrelly, and that's basically how it ends. It almost feels like they were trying to do their own version of the end of Monty Python and the Holy Grail, but it really doesn't work. In fact, the entire movie doesn't work. Quaid's character acts as if he's pitching a single coherent script for his movie. But the sketches obviously have no connection to each other, there's those weird-ass commercials that keep popping up throughout the film, and that ending just comes out of nowhere. By the time the credits rolled, I was horribly confused. Until I learned about the alternate cut. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, and all points in between, there are two versions of Movie 43. And I'm not talking about your typical unrated edition that reinserts about two and a half seconds of footage they removed to get an R rating. The sketches are the same in both versions and appear in the same order, and the two cut sketches are still cut. But the overarching plot is completely different. Gone is the half-crazed screenwriter trying to pitch his half-baked movie. Instead, we have a couple of teenagers trying to become internet famous by doing jackass-type stunts. At first, they think they're getting a shitload of views, but it turns out one guy's little brother is a computer genius who lured them to a fake YouTube site to fool them into thinking they were getting a shitload of views just before pulling the rug out from under them. It is remarkable and pathetic just how much time these kids have on their hands. The teens decide to counter the little brother's prank by convincing him they're trying to find the most banned movie on the internet known only as Movie 43. While the kid uses his know-how to attempt to find the movie they just made up, they'll take his laptop and load it up with viruses by visiting a ton of porn sites. Which seems like a waste of time, because if that kid is smart enough to fool them by building a fake YouTube site, surely a few viruses aren't going to slow him down. You know that little shit as a backup. Anyway, this leads to the kid finding these weird sketches in the darkest corners of the internet. And that makes so much more sense. Of course you're gonna find a bunch of weird and stupid videos on the internet. Hi! And of course the sketches have no connection to each other. They're not meant to. The ads make a lot more sense in this version too. You're not going to see ads in the middle of a movie, but you will see them on the internet. See? You just saw an ad. Unless you have YouTube Premium, or you're watching this on an ad-free platform, in which case that joke didn't land, but oh well. At some point, they encounter Fisher Stevens as some sketchy Russian dude warning them not to look for Movie 43. Apparently, it is actually real, and it can give you the ability to see the future or something. Then the kid throws a ton of metal in the microwave. Somehow this boosts his computer's processing power, which means the people who made this movie understand technology as well as they understand the human body. And eventually they find the actual Movie 43, a video from the future where the kid warns himself not to trigger the apocalypse. Which happens anyway, making the whole thing entirely pointless. And roll credits. And then in the middle of the credits, we get the sketch with the pervy cartoon cat. Actually, this happens in the theatrical cut as well. I do not understand that decision in either version. This ain't the MCU. This ain't even the DCEU. Hell, this movie wishes it was the Dark Universe. Ooh, that might have been too far. This is definitely the superior version of the movie. Low bar, I know, but it's true. It's still bad and stupid and not funny and stupid, but at least I understand the overarching plot. While I cannot definitively prove it since the filmmakers have not been eager to talk about Movie 43 since its release, shocking, I know, I'm quite certain this is what the filmmakers originally intended. And in some parts of the world, this is the version that was released to theaters, which means some of my international viewers must be horribly confused right now. But I guess test screenings didn't go well, so they rewrote and reshot the overarching plot for American audiences. I mean, there's no way this was plan B, right? 
No disrespect to Fisher Stevens, I like Fisher Stevens, but I think even he would tell you the studio ain't choosing him over Dennis Quaid. And that makes movie 43 all the more infuriating. They already had a plot that mostly made sense, and they threw it away for something that was clearly thrown together at great expense and at the last minute that didn't fit what they already had in mind. And it's not like the bit with the kids searching for videos on the internet was the movie's biggest problem. Far from it. Its biggest problem is it's not funny. And that's Movie 43 in a nutshell. It's an hour and a half of comedy sketches that aren't funny. What more do I need to say? I can't complain about the actors, their performances were perfectly fine, and I normally enjoy it when big-time Hollywood actors are willing to degrade themselves on camera. It didn't particularly work this time around, but they tried. And with one or two exceptions, it does seem like they were having fun at the time. Not many were willing to talk about it afterwards, though when asked about the movie, Stephen Merchant sarcastically quipped, I had to spend two days looking at Halle Berry. It was a living hell. Oh, you poor bastard. And even the direction was at least competent, and they had some actual talent behind the camera, including James Gunn who directed the sketch with that stupid cartoon cat. Gunn later admitted he hadn't seen the finished product, and they never even let him in the editing room. And even if they had, what could he have done? No, the problems lie entirely with the script. Movie 43 is an ill-conceived, thrown-together, unfunny mess, and in the end, it took home three Razzies for worst screenplay, worst director, and worst picture. And now comes the part where I decide if this really deserved to be named the worst movie of 2013. Well, it had some good competition from its fellow Worst Picture nominees, which included Adam Sandler's Grown Ups 2, Disney's The Lone Ranger, which somehow featured Johnny Depp in Whiteface and Redface at the same time, After Earth, which I've already talked about on this show, and... <laughs> nope, that was it. There were only four nominees that year. I'm not sure why they did that. So, what was really the worst movie of 2013? Well, I'll tell you. Do you remember when I talked about the underground comedy movie? Well, I regret to inform you that in the year of our Lord 2013, the ShamWow guy was back on his bullshit. The same year Movie 43 was unleashed upon the public, Vince Offer released a follow-up to the underground comedy movie titled Inappropriate Comedy. Hell if I know who was asking for that, but there it is. And it was significantly more successful than the underground comedy movie, which spent all of one day in a single theater. Inappropriate Comedy was released in almost 300 theaters and lasted a full week before getting pulled, making about $228,000. I don't know what it cost to make, but I wouldn't be surprised if it technically made a profit. The movie opens with one of the few genuine chuckles I got while watching this travesty, a parody of 127 hours where the guy is just about to cut off his arm, but then Vince Offer just casually walks by. Hey, how you doing? Hello. Hello? Then Vince takes a seat under a sewer grate and points a fan and a camera upward so he can capture upskirt shots of Lindsay Lohan doing the famous Marilyn Monroe pose. Obviously, this was filmed while Lohan was going through some legal troubles, which they didn't even try to hide. It's not particularly funny, and it's unoriginal. Vince already did this exact same sketch with Gina Lee Nolan in the first movie. Then we see a bunch of bikers, except they're actually riding bicycles and not motorcycles, which was also in the first movie. I don't even think they reshot that. It's the exact same footage. If I wanted to watch the underground comedy movie again, I would just watch the underground comedy movie again. Also, I need to be checked into a psych ward because why in God's name would I want to watch that again? And then we get our literal connecting device, a tablet that Vince uses to load various apps that contain the sketches, hence the highlighted app in Inappropriate. That sounds oddly similar to the original version of Movie 43, and the two movies started production around the same time. I can't say for sure if one ripped off the other, but that is a hell of a coincidence. Anyway, the tablet would lead you to believe there are as many as 20 sketches in the movie. It's a lie. Vince only selects seven apps from the tablet, many of them multiple times, because coming up with enough unique ideas to fill an 80-minute movie was apparently too much to ask. Two apps are shown exactly once. One is Psychology World, where a psychologist played by Rob Schneider interviews a nymphomaniac who is trying to change her ways, and then he chokes to death because comedy? It's about as funny as most of Schneider's work. Then there's Things You'll Never See, which shows a beautiful young woman dating an old man who is poor. 
This is also recycled from the underground comedy movie. Christ on a cracker, what is going on here? Apart from that, we have different versions of the same four sketches repeated over and over ad nauseum. And boy am I feeling a lot of nauseum after watching this shit. There's Porno Review, where, as the title says, people review pornos. It also stars Schneider, because if you've got him for the full day, you might as well make the most of it. There's Adrian Brody as Flirty Harry, a gay cop that speaks entirely in double entendres, sort of like Dirty Harry meets the ambiguously gay duo. This got a chuckle out of me at first, but there's only so many times you can tell the same joke before it gets old. And in addition to being repetitive, both of these sketches are, you guessed it, recycled from the underground comedy movie. Jeez, is Vince really this lazy? Good God, man, at least pretend to take some pride in your work. One of the remaining two oft-repeated sketches is Blackass, a jackass parody with black stereotypes. Except they give up on the jackass stunts about halfway through and just keep doing the stereotypes because, yes, they are that creatively bankrupt. And finally, we have the one part of the movie that Offer had nothing to do with apart from financing. It stars Ari Shafir as the Amazing Racist, which is described on Wikipedia as a spoof of the Amazing Race, though apart from the title, I don't see any connection between the two. Basically, Ari goes around doing incredibly racist shit. And that's literally it. It's kind of like if someone tried to make their own version of Borat, but didn't fully understand what made Borat funny. So really, he just comes across as a douchebag. And the sketches are entirely too long. The first minute is enough to get the joke, and I use that word loosely, but then he keeps going for five, six, seven minutes, and oh my god, dude, we get it. Move on to something else. No, not that. The only time it actually approaches being funny is when Ari's victims point out that he himself is Jewish, which he constantly denies. There's a really weird moment toward the end of the movie where a black dude actually starts a fight with him, prompting a passing police officer to break it up. And Ari actually breaks character and tells the black guy and the cop it's just a joke and they're doing a hidden camera show, which he admits he doesn't have a permit for. It's made to look like a real moment that is not part of the show, though I've seen enough pro wrestling to know when someone is pulling his punches. And unless these supposedly random passersby just happen to be mic'd up for no reason, I have my doubts about this not being in the script. However, there probably are a lot of people in Los Angeles who walk around mic'd up all the time, so I suppose I can't totally rule it out. It's incredibly racist and incredibly dumb and rarely funny. But unlike most of this movie, at least it's not an idea recycled from a previous movie. Is what I'd like to say if Ari hadn't recycled it from the movie Lost Reality, another lame sketch comedy movie released back in 2004. The sketches themselves are new because Ari didn't have the rights to the old sketches, he only had the name, but it's basically the same deal of him being a racist shit weasel to a supposedly unsuspecting public. To be fair, very few people actually saw Lost Reality. I myself hadn't even heard of it until I started doing research for this review. I'm pretty sure more people saw the underground comedy movie. That one I had at least heard of. Those infomercials are forever burned into my brain. And no, I am not going to review this piece of shit for two reasons. One, a lot of it is way too hot for YouTube. And two, two terrible sketch movies in one review is enough, thank you. Anyway, we close the movie by returning to Lindsay Lohan, who murders several paparazzi, which I'm sure she'd like to do in real life, and I can't say I blame her, and then we get outtakes during the credits, which are much funnier than the actual sketches, which I think sufficiently highlights everything wrong with this movie. And that's inappropriate comedy. As bad as Movie 43 is, this is worse, and I'll tell you why. Movie 43 is terrible and a comedic black hole from which no laughs can escape, but I can tell there was some actual honest-to-God effort behind it. Misplaced effort, perhaps, but it was still there. I cannot say the same for inappropriate comedy. Hell, about 90% of it is just Offer and Shafir rehashing their old material with a slightly bigger budget, and the remaining 10% relies on tired old stereotypes that went out of style a decade ago. It's about 80 minutes of pure laziness, and it deserves the Worst Picture Award far more than Movie 43. So there you go, Elizabeth Weitzman. I found you a worse movie. Yet somehow, it was only nominated for a single Razzie, Worst Supporting Actress for Lindsay Lohan, who played herself. Well, that's just dumb. 
I cannot recommend anyone seek out either movie. There's almost no entertainment value in either, even of the unintentional variety. They're just plain not funny. And a comedy that is not funny serves no purpose. Speaking of things that serve no purpose, next time we are revisiting the work of Kirk Cameron. Until then, I am the Smeghead, and after that, I may need another three-month hiatus. Or at least a very large whiskey. This may be the only show on the internet to actually get guys to stop jerking off.